delighted to introduce once again by popular demand you you asked for her and you've got her um hinder young who had, gave us a fabulous talk the last time and and once again has something really exciting up her sleeve for you and we're absolutely delighted to welcome you hinder and please go ahead and thank you for being here thank you so much. it's it's so good to see everyone, um, and it's really good to be back on The Great Women. All of the different offerings have been so interesting, so I hope that this um, holds up with its contemporaries. So when I decided to speak about the Jews of ancient Rome, I really should give some background. I studied abroad in Rome for six months when I was in university, and I fell in love with Rome, the eternal city. And so, but the coolest part for me about when I was studying was I was taking part in an American university study abroad program, but I was really lucky to find a Jewish roommate in Rome who lived near the Jewish ghetto. Um, and it was her uh, building that her parents lived in and her grandparents had lived in. And somehow she had an apartment in that building that she was looking for other flatmates. And I was lucky enough to get connected with her and live in really one of the best locations in Rome with somebody who was like authentically Roman Jewish. And she became a really good friend. I've since gone back to Rome with my husband, Rabbi Elton Ben, and we went to see her and meet her kids. And it's just been a really wonderful relationship. And I will also plug that one of her business ventures at the moment is creating um, silk tully tote, so a Sephardic style silk tully. And Robert Samuel has an, uh, one that he's very proud of, and it's really gorgeous. So if you're ever in the market for a silk tully or you know anyone who is, um, come and speak to me and I can connect you to Dora. So, but when I asked Dora, like I was, you know, we were, I just moved in, we were chatting. I said, so how long has your family been in Rome? And she sort of said, like, oh, my father's family, like, forever. <laughs> and I didn't really know what that meant. And when Ben and I were visiting Rome, Ben has kangaroo cufflinks. And he went to the Great Synagogue, and he was wearing his kangaroo cufflinks. And they somehow they realized that he was a rabbi in Sydney, and they, like, brought him to the front. And the guy sitting next to him said, oh, look at your kangaroo cufflinks. Those are so cool. And they started chatting. And Ben said, so what's your family story in Rome? You know, how long have you lived here? And he said, oh, my ancestors were slaves who were brought over, you know, look at the Arch of Titus, that's me. And I think most of us, if we think about Roman Jewry um, or visiting Rome, I think if you've ever visited Rome, one of the sites that every Jewish person has to go see is in the Roman Forum, there's the Arch of Titus that depicts, um, I think it's Vespasian, maybe I'm um, bringing back like all the spoils and one of the big, very recognizable items is he's bringing back the spoils from the temple and a menorah. So that's really, there's been, there's evidence, even other evidence than the Arch of Titus, that there was a Jewish community in Rome since like the second um, century or even earlier. There's even some that Judah Maccabee sent some envoys to Rome or to like ambassadors and you know that a small community started forming so this is really ancient um, you know one of the most ancient diaspora Jewish communities today and it really sort of fa started fascinated me because when I was in university I studied Greek and Latin and so I was reading about Roman history and ancient Greek history and it was really cool that at the same time there was Jewish history in, in Rome. So, but what we know about Rome, it's, we don't know so much about ancient times. And that's why I was getting a little bit nervous preparing this presentation because I gave you this title, the Jews of ancient Rome. But the actual fact is that we really don't know so much about the Jews in ancient Rome. Most people who, who've traveled to Rome know about the Jewish ghetto. And I'll actually pull up a map because I think that's the most effective way to do this. So here's a map of Rome um, that you should all be able to see. And if we go into sort of the center of Rome, um, I guess, can people who have their cameras on raise your hand if you've been 
to Rome. Okay, I'm seeing a few hands. Yeah. Okay, so this isn't all lost on everyone. So um, most people have visited the Colosseum, the Colosseo. Um, can you see my pointer? Raise your hand if you can see my pointer. Yeah. So the Colosseo, that's what you can see. And what's really cool is that when I was living in Rome, I lived at Via Arenula Cinque Tre. And that is right here on the Tiber River. So there's the Tiber Island. This is the Tiber River. And if you just like a five minute walk down the road is the Jewish, the great synagogue, Tempio Maggiore. And this area where the stars are, those are where I've starred kosher restaurants or my favorite kosher restaurants in Rome. Um, that's Bacione that has the best crostata with ricotta and cherries, crostata di visciole. Um, so this is the Jewish ghetto. And so I was living right here overlooking the Tiber River with the Jewish ghetto. Um, but this Jewish ghetto area was really only built in like 1555. So, and it's, the walls are, you know, it changed size over time. If anyone took a tour of the Jewish ghetto, you sort of know what I'm saying. But so you think, oh, ancient, ancient Rome, Jewish ghetto. Well, this isn't really ancient. We're talking about the second to fifth centuries um, uh, AD or BC, uh, CE, the common era. But we know of Jewish settlement from like the second century BC. Um, BC. Um, so really ancient. So how would we know anything about ancient Jews in Rome? And a lot of the archaeological evidence, we kind of know that Jews don't necessarily always have the strongest material culture because there aren't always so many images. Um, they're definitely like if there were synagogues in ancient Rome in like the second century BCE, we don't have any remains of that. But um, I would say about starting in the 16th century, they uncovered catacombs. And the catacombs are underground burial places. And they uncovered a bunch of catacombs that didn't look like the Christian catacombs. And they realized it must be Jewish catacombs. So I'm just going to go back to my list of places and show you that they, the first catacomb that they uncovered um, I think was, it may not have saved. No, it was the one I meant to bring. Ah. Okay, never mind that. Um, they uncovered a bunch of catacombs, and let me just show you where they are. So. No, didn't want to do that. So if you look at where the red um, point dropping is, these are the different catacombs that they discovered over a period of many years. So, um, and these aren't exact locations because a lot of these catacombs, A, when they were discovered had been looted, which is another reason why the evidence is so sort of scant. Um, and they were already disturbed when they were discovered, but also since having been discovered, a bunch of them have been sort of not, have the grounds collapsed, so they don't really exist anymore. So this is a Christian catacomb actually, but there was a Jewish catacomb discovered next to it. So these are around the old Appian Way, which is a Roman landmark. This is, um, there was a catacomb, ah, there was a catacomb discovered here near um, Porta Maggiore, which is the big gate. And I think this is about a mile from this drop point that I'm showing you now. Um, was where the first catacomb was discovered. This is the most significant catacomb. If you're familiar at all with Roman history, this is the Mussolini's elegant villa and gardens, but actually under Mussolini's villa, they discovered a Jewish catacomb that's actually yielded, I think, most of what we know about ancient Judaism. And another one around here. And ah, this, sorry, my mistake. This is the first one that they discovered. So. That's just to give you a sense. Um, these catacombs, if you look at when I scroll my mouse over them, they're sort of all on the outskirts of the city. So if you imagine that near the Colosseum is the Roman Forum, 
um, in the middle of like the ancient city. And then if you look, these are all on the outskirts and that would make sense because that's where um, people were buried on the outskirts of the city, like how Rookwood is far away from the city. Um, and you know, Macquarie Park, not to be biased against cemeteries. So, so they discovered all these catacombs. So why is this like so interesting that I'm telling you about catacombs? Because really this is how we know, um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna pull up a different, so, so what do these catacombs tell us? Like you discover these catacombs and it tells you, they, the catacombs themselves have told us a huge amount, everything that we do know, which isn't a huge amount, but everything that we know has come from these catacombs about what Judaism was like in ancient times. Um, and let me share a bit more. Okay. So this is what it looked like when they entered these catacombs. Underground rooms that then had niches for the graves. Um, and they're called like loculi and they're sort of curved. And there were also a type of grave called a kochen, um, which they look like graves that exist in Judea from that same time period. So it's, it sort of is a clear, it's a clear identification with other Jewish burial grounds because that's not what the other catacombs, the other catacombs didn't have that specific type of grave. So coffin graves are cut into the floor and they're, the narrow part is what's cut into the wall and the loculi are more like where the long part faces the wall. So, and the kofim have arched rather than flat ceilings. So that is, that is one thing that immediately can alert the people who, the different um, archeologists who found these graves that these were Jewish catacombs. And the other thing that cool, that was, um, this looks like sort of a mythological scene um, looks sort of similar to, this doesn't look very Jewish because we don't usually have figures, um, but it is, it is part of the Jewish catacomb. But look at this. So this is the wall paintings on one of the catacombs um, and clearly has Jewish symbols. And so aside from the mythical, the mythological scene, these six catacombs that have been discovered over the years they really didn't have the same kind of imagery as Christian catacombs. And what they had, the imagery that they did have was distinctly Jewish. And so it can reveal to us that there was sort of an independent Jewish identity or independent Jewish burials. And the question that like I became very interested in when I studied this, this information was, so what made, what were the markers of Jewish identity in ancient Rome? Like how did Jews identify themselves um, as distinct from Romans um, at that time? And one thing that I forgot to mention when I was showing you the map is, and I think I'll actually just go back to the map because it's worth it. Um, what I should have said earlier um, is that if you look at the, the, so the Jewish ghetto now is around here, but the, what we kind of know about the Jews in Rome is that they lived on the other side of the Tiber. So they lived, this is the side, of, this is the side of the Tiber that, you know, the Roman, um, forum is, um, around here. That's the Roman Forum ish um, there. Um, so that's the side of the ti Tiber. Oh, here's the Roman Forum also. Um, that the Roman Forum is. But on the other side of the Tiber is where the Jews lived. And some people said, some archaeologists said, like, this tells us that the Jews were like merchants and shipping and were very wealthy. But other archaeologists have really said, like, no, this is the area that would like flood. And it happened in the Jewish ghetto as well, the one that was actually constructed in 1555, is you're on the side, banks of the Tiber and it becomes like a area of like, sort of like filth and sewage and flooding. So the Jews didn't, and this whole area 
it wasn't just Jews living there, it was anyone who was like non-native Roman. So it really wasn't such a great place to live. So we kind of start, we, we don't have the sense like from what we know about Jews that they had, they had like the most, um, they didn't have like the best living conditions, let's say. But what we learn from their, um, what we learn from the grave goods and what we see in the catacombs is that there was sort of, there was a unique um, Jewish culture and, or a Jewish identity. And that there's signs, there's sometimes signs of assimilation or acculturation where, you know, like these mythological elements that are painted on the walls. And then there's signs that are distinctly Jewish, like menorahs. Um, and you see that in the language that's used. You see that there's Greek and there's Hebrew. Um, and in the names. Um, so you see, and this, this comes through in the rest of... Um, what information is learned from the catacombs. So this is an example of what the types of gravestones that were found in the catacombs. So it's written in Greek. Um, and, but what I like about this example, and you can see a lot of these at the Vatican. They have them um, in the Vatican museums. They have sort of a section, late antiquity, that has a bunch of these stones. And you also, if you ever visit the Jewish museum, um, at, it's the Jewish Museum is underneath the synagogue and they have a bunch of these stones outside. Um, but a lot of them, even when these catacombs were discovered in the 1600s, had already been ransacked and these tiles had been moved. Um, but what's so cool about this one is A, you see a menorah, but you also see what kind of looks like a lulav and an etrog and an oil jar. So. I think this shows that the markers like that nowadays we do, we also put a menorah sometimes on um, graves, but I've also seen like the hand symbol for Kohanim. A lot of times it's the Star of David. So we do identify Jewish graves by putting some sort of symbol. And that's what I'm going to assume that the people who, you know, had were buried in these catacombs, managed these catacombs, what they wanted to do was mark these as Jewish graves. And these are the symbols that they chose. So one of the um, one of the reasons, like the menorah, I think was was chosen, was that it's just really recognizable. Um, there are earlier examples of like using temple. You know, if you, I think if people die and they want to, or their loved ones want to mark their burial place, they sort of want to remember the temple in Jerusalem. And they might, you know, want to have a symbol from the temple. And so they might have, you know, there are other elements from the temple. There's like the, the show bread. There's like, a, it's called the shulchan. It's like a table that carried these breads. But like, that's kind of boring. <laughs> so as like a, as a visual symbol. So Stephen Fine, who's a big archaeologist who writes about this topic, he says like, obviously the menorah is just visually um, appealing. Because um, 144 out of a recorded 534 inscriptions have the symbol of the menorah. So the seven branches of the menorah make it easily recognizable. So, and also at the time that these catacombs were in use, that there was the, the items from the temple were on display in Rome. So the Jews of Rome could view this symbol as like an, an exa like a symbol of their religious identity. It connects back to the temple in Jerusalem. It connects to the um, capture. And I think a lot of the Jewish community of Rome grew sort of exponentially when all these captured slaves came with um, the Spasian back to Rome. So it's a memory of like sort of maybe what they left behind and it's because it's so visually appearing, it takes appealing, it takes on um, extra significance as it becomes like the symbol used on all these uh, tombstones. So, but the next question is like, what else was found in the, um, these catacombs? So in Roman catacombs, I'm sure if you've ever been to like a big, I don't, I don't know about the museums in Australia, but like, I haven't been to some of these archaeology museums, but in the Metropolitan Museum in New York, um, any of the museums in Rome, you're going to see a lot of sarcophagi. 
<laughs> right? These are sort of like marble coffins. Um, and they all have different artistic depictions. Um, you know, sometimes they have depictions of war. But what's really cool is that you see a sarcophagus with, um, these are like sort of messengers carrying a medallion, and the medallion is a menorah. Because what, what you can see happening, and scholars sort of argue about this, but is that here there's a Jew who's wealthy enough to afford a marble sarcophagus, which is very much in keeping with what everyone else, like all the other elites in Rome are doing for their burial. And this Jew decides, oh, I'm going to have a marble sarcophagus, but I'm going to make it Jewish, and I'm going to put a, a menorah on it. So there aren't so many marble sarcophagus found in the catacombs. I mean, obviously, like, I'm going to keep coming back to the fact, like, we really don't know what time period exactly the catacombs are from, and we don't know a lot about, you know, we, we don't, we can't, nothing, so few of what was found in the catacombs was found, like, in situ, which is, like, in its like original place and that's really important with archaeology so a lot of what we know about the catacombs is like a bit corrupted because they were so looted over the years um but even though we you know i just said that the jews lived on the side of the tiber and were kind of poor and you know most of them have these little like marble slabs well there are still aristocrats elites who decide to have you know marble sarcophagus and they put Jewish symbols on this very Roman um, item. And so they're like, they're, and there's still Roman features on the sarcophagus, right? There's like victories and cupids, but there's something, there's an identifying feature which makes it Jewish. Um, and so the final, well, the final really interesting thing that they found in the catacombs are, these are called gold glasses. And they were originally thought to be like funerary um, bowls and they're the bottom of the bowls that are like broken out and that's gold leaf um, adorning the bowls and making the design. And they, these are some examples and they're sort of like Christian uh, examples or sort of pagan. I don't really remember exactly what these examples are, but you see this example of what a Roman um, gold glass is, um, and then you see uh, very clearly, what do we see? Our menorah, our oil jars, our lion, that radish looking thing, maybe that's maror, um, that looks like a shofar to me. So we see all, and this looks like some sort of art holding documents. So very cool. So what's also so cool about these gold glasses is that they really in design are like so, so similar um, to the Christian ones. So some are so similar that they have to have been like, scholars say they must have been constructed in the same workshop. So Christian and Jewish like funerary items constructed together. And some scholars say that it must be like a Jewish technique and all gold glasses. So even when there's like a Christian gold glass that has like lots of Christian symbols, it must have been made by Jewish artisans. So, but the, the, obviously the gold glasses found in the Jewish catacombs contain these Jewish motifs. So here's another one that has some sort of arc, um, a menorah, a shofar. Um, I can't really tell exactly what else is there. So these are also in the Vatican. And I have to say like one of the saddest moments is I went back to the Vatican and I went like looking for it and I found the display case and it wasn't in the display case. So I haven't actually seen this in person. But if you go to the Vatican, maybe you'll have better luck than I did. Um, so this, th these gold glasses add a whole other element to the catacombs and what they tell us about the Jewish life because 
previously, like I said about those inscriptions, and I, I only showed you one example, obviously, but imagine lots of inscriptions like this with lots of variations of like which symbols are used. And if you notice, they're in Greek. Um, and something that I, that other like full books have been written about is like, what are the names on all these funerary inscriptions? Like what are the names of the Jewish people? And it's really interesting because a lot of times there actually aren't that many biblical names. The, there are like Alexander's a really common name. So, you know, if you know any Alex's, that's like been a Jewish um, name for a very long time. Um, and there are other names that are like Latinized versions of Jewish names. So like, um, like you know, around like the Josephs, <laughs> um, Eusephus or whatever. Um, so, so there are the, but there are also a lot of names that just sound like any other Roman name. And so a lot of scholars have like tried to say like, oh, there was a lot of, you know, acculturation, assimilation based on the names, um, based on the Greek. Um, but there are also, there are also some inscriptions in Hebrew, like especially for like a scholar. So that sort of tells us the, the, the message that I take away from all of this is like, it was kind of a diverse community in that there were people who were, um, you know, more Romanized or acculturated, but there were, at the same time, there were people who, you know, there were scholars who knew Hebrew. Um, and you get this, I see it as a spectrum in, in sort of a lot of ways and that you get, like I've showed you, there's a lot of evidence of poverty um, um, or not great wealth amongst the Roman Jewish community, but then there's evidence that like, you know, you have to be pretty wealthy to create one of these marble sarcophagi. Um, Say for a gold leaf plated funerary bowl. I mean, you have to have some cash sitting around in order to, you know, have one of these commissioned to be left at your resting place. So the other cool and little fat feature of these gold glasses is when you look at this arc, um, it relates to actually Oh, here's another one. I forgot about this. Again, so cool. Ark, lions, menorahs, um, jugs of oil, etrog, shofar. I think that's pretty cool. Okay, so these different gold glass sort of lead me to like one other area that we know things about ancient Jews of late antiquity. And um, it's the, there's a synagogue at Ostia Antica. Ostia was a port town um, a little ways away from Rome. It takes now, I think like about an hour on the train if you go there and it's, it's kind of like Pompeii in that it's mostly intact. So you can walk around Ostia and like see ancient streets. And um, it's actually, it's really, it's a good um, little adventure. When we ever can travel again and you are planning a trip to Italy, I'm happy to um, advise you on where to go. But um, so the, the synagogue structure at Ostia is iconographically contiguous and also contemporaneous with the catacombs. So it's dating from the same time, from the second to the fifth century. Um, but it, it does have an original structure that's from much earlier. So this is sort of an, this is what you see when you go to Ostia today. These marble pillars are not original, but they were brought there to, we know that there were marble pillars there, so um, it's a nice way to get a sense of what it might have been like. This is sort of the entrance. But the most interesting element for our purposes today is this is the niche where um, the Torah was kept. And what's really cool is that it doesn't face Jerusalem. So, um, usually around the world, um, arcs face Jerusalem. Um, and that's why it's like kind of cool that here we have our arc on a different wall than it is in the Northern hemisphere, because we're in the Southern hemisphere, but the synagogue in Ostia doesn't have, um, doesn't face, the arc doesn't face Jerusalem. And that indicates that this was actually built before the destruction of the temple in 70 CE, but because of the way the Torah scribe is constructed, this little apse, this brick technique is called opus vitata mixtum, and it's only a technique that was popular around the late third century. So we kind of know that this must have been built around the late third century. And 
there does exist sort of hints that there was some sort of portable wooden shrine. Um, and this, because there was an inscription in Greek saying that Mindios Faustus established an art for the holy law, and the word that they use for the art is called kibotos, which is a word that kind of also means wooden box, a wooden container. So we have, we have some like evidence that there was some sort of structure, wooden structure used to hold the art beforehand. So what's so cool about that is because what do you see in these gold glasses? You see some sort of wooden structure to hold the art. And it's actually even visible as well in the painting on the wall in this Villa Torleon. Um, let me just, yeah, in, in the symbol on the wall of the painting. So that's another picture where you can see the, the brickwork. And you can also see that on these marble columns, there were menorahs, which you can't see so well in that picture unless you know what you're looking for. But here is a reconstruction of what that arc would look like with the menorahs on the columns and some sort of like wooden holding structure. So where does this all lead us to what we know about Jews in ancient Rome? And so what I always the assumption that I came to in thinking about all this different material evidence, this is material culture. Um, and, you know, when people study ancient history, they also look at the literary records. So um, looking at Roman poetry from that time, what does it tell us about Jews? We do know that Jews um, supported Julius Caesar because um, Cicero gives a speech where he says, like, there's going to be this whole horde of masses of Jews Morning, Cicero, morning Caesar, so like, um, and he sort of, uh, you know, sort of labels them as like the mob, the rabble. Um, so we have, but, we, but what that tells us is that Jews were around that time um, supporting Caesar and we're just in Rome. And we're, we're um, more than we're in Rome, we're like a recognized part of Rome. But so that's one thing from Cicero, but also the Roman poet um, Suetonius, um, he sort of had this inadequate idea that Jews fasted on the Sabbath. So there, and other Roman uh, writers like mention the Jews, usually always negative, but what they sort of mention are the Jewish ritual practices. And the most interesting one is this like strange idea that the Jews fasted on the, shop, the Sabbath. Because what I think we learn from all of this is what identified to themselves as being Jewish were their ritual practices. So the menorah is like a symbol of ritual life. It's something that we did in the temple and then now we do on the festival of Hanukkah. But all these other um, ritual symbols like a lulav, these are the symbols of the festivals. And that's what identifies the community as being Jewish. And we know that there was like sort of this strong Jewish identity if they were, they were being buried, sort of, they were burying themselves separately in these different catacombs. And, and I don't wanna, different archeologists and scholars have studied like the different catacombs. And they've also learned um, a lot about sort of the synagogue structure at that time, because there were a lot of, um, inscriptions that sort of like gave different people's positions. So like the president of the synagogue. But I don't know if this will come as a surprise to you, but like the synagogue organization was actually like one of the least interesting elements of um, this whole topic to me because I think it's so much cooler to look at sort of the material remnants and have a sort of ask ourselves like what identified Jewish people as Jewish and what did were the rituals that they actually practiced. And so you see it on their funerary objects um, that they put special emphasis on these, um, on these ritual objects. And so, um, and they're connected through like, through the pictures of the um, ark they're connecting themselves also not just to ritual, but to the synagogue. 
that having this strong connection to the synagogue that we see at Ostia, there's an existing synagogue and there's the Torah reading, that's what um, were the markers of Jewish identity in ancient Rome. So that's most of my like formal presentation. I'm happy to take questions. And if anything wasn't clear, please ask me to clarify. And I'll, I'm gonna unshare, stop sharing. Okay, wow. That, that was amazing. If anybody has any, any questions, if you want to pop them into the chat box or raise your hand and unmute yourself um, and, uh, and ask, ask your questions. Um, I have one hinder the, um, in the catacombs where you showed the stone with all the symbols and in the Greek writing, did those writings um, give some idea about the people for, you know, like the ages of, of the deceased? Um, what, what does it tell us about the Jewish people themselves? Yeah, so it, a lot of times it, it does give ages. And so we, we, especially with like women, it tells like, who their children, not all the time, but in some indication it tells like who their children were. And one of the things that they've realized is like people usually, women usually married around 15 um, because there's like a few people who it says that they were unmarried and that's like notable if they were like 19, 20. Um, and, and there are, you know, there are actually, what's really sad is there are a lot of um, unmarked children's grave so uh, and we we know that that would make sense because you know we know that there's childhood uh, mortality in that time um but yeah it does it does live uh it does give ages and i actually i don't remember like exactly what the you know for men especially like what the median age was but there there are names i mean people have compiled like the names the ages everything we know so Right, right. And in, in Austria, when you, you showed the ark, did they also, have there been um, uh, mikvahs found? In That's a good question. I don't think they found a mikvah in Austria. So the synagogue is really cool. I mean, it's worth like a lot more time because it kind of, it has like a study hall, it has a kitchen. So it's really an extensive building that was built over a period of time. Based on that, like, if I showed you the opus, the Tatian Mixtum, there's opus reticulatum which is an earlier form of um brickwork and so that's in some parts and there's different um brickwork in other parts and and those types of masonry were only used at certain times um, yeah um we, ha we have a question here from cecil rosengren so interesting hinder do we know anything about what percentage of the population of rome the jews represented a very good question. I think it was very, very, very small, um, especially in that early period. Um, there were, because like I said, we know that like two representatives came from Judah Maccabee at like the earliest time, and then some slaves were brought, but I don't know exact um, percentages, but I would imagine that it was really small. Because it was also a practice like for the Roman army, if there was if they waged a war somewhere else to bring back other slaves. So it wasn't like when I said about the Jews living on the other side of the Tiber, they weren't just living like just in a Jewish area. There were Jews, um, there were anyone who wasn't a native Roman, uh, many other types of slaves from many other places were living there as well. And just an, another question that I had when, when we visited Spain a few years ago, we found that Spain is really emphasizing all the cities where there were Jewish populations and they're, you know, renovated synagogues and museums. And it's almost like they really are trying to increase Jewish tourism by, by highlighting the, these things and really making something of them. Is, is there something like that in Italy as well? Yeah, so, I mean, the Roman Jewish story sort of goes on and on. And nowadays that, Jewish ghetto is like a really popular tourist area because it's sort of unpaved and there's restaurants and, and there's, I mean, and there, but there is still this like living Jewish community there. It's not huge. I think it's like 40,000 Jews, maybe. Um, uh, many were killed in the Holocaust, 
but the community had a real infusion of Jewish people from Tripoli, um, I think late 70s, um, from Libya. So, but there is, there's schools, um, there are tons of synagogues, there's like, there's a whole other Jewish neighborhood, sort of like the Bondi of Rome, um, that has, um, like, you know, lots of kosher restaurants and things like that. So, so I, but there is now an emphasis definitely on like, show, like the Jewish ghetto as a tourist site, but I think also they do have to reckon with like the Holocaust. And so they have those brass plaques on the floor from the buildings where people were taken. And like my friend Dora's grandfather was hidden in a church. Um, so there is a whole, um, there is a whole history there. Yeah, we have another question here. How many synagogues do you find in Rome today? Um, I don't know, many. <laughs> um, there's like the great synagogue, that Tempio Maggiore, but there's, and there's also a synagogue on the Tiber Island, um, which are like the one, I don't know. And then there, there's another like big synagogue sort of near the central um, train station, but in the Jewish area, there's tons of small shtibles, like a Chabad shul, and also because so many Jews came from Tripoli, there's tons of shuls in the Tripolino, right? But I will say, I was in Rome for Yom Kippur, and so even when there aren't synagogues that are open, or even when there's too many people, like on Yom Kippur, to fit in all the synagogues that exist, they turn the old age home into like a Yom Kippur service, and that had like over, it was like in a tent, and it had over a thousand people. So, I really couldn't say. Many, many, many. Right, we have um, two comments here. Anne C, fascinating history I never knew. Thanks, Hinda. And then Karen Pryor, something interesting. She writes, Titus sent 10,000 armed Jewish slaves to Sardinia as a garrison, revoking the law that slaves were not allowed to bear arms. Yeah, well, I don't, I didn't know that. Thank you for sharing that. But there were Jewish communities as well in Naples, um, in other, yeah, the, in other parts of um, Sicily, there was Jewish communities. And so they found like mikvaot in Sicily. It was really cool. I was on some house tour in Sicily and it was, they said like, oh yeah, this house, we found a mikvah in the basement. And they're obviously, they're not as old as, again, late antiquity, third to fifth century BC, but they're very old. Yeah. Uh Karen has added something here. Th thanks for your comments, Karen. She says, there are about 12 active synagogues. The one on Tiber Island is the Synagoga dei Giovanni. 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 Um, yeah, yeah, I think I would guess that there are more than 12, but I think they're, that's not that way. Interesting, interesting. Any, anyone else want to? Comment, Leonie, if you unmute yourself, you can ask your question. You click your unmute button. Yeah, I need you. Because uh, we can't unmute you. Yes, I've got it. Yeah. You got it. Lovely. Thanks. Go Love. ahead, Leonie. Hello. I'm from Melbourne. Mm. And um, it's great to join you. We were former members of the Great Synagogue many, many years ago. Um, some of you may remember Harry Engel. And... Um, Anyway, um, he sends his very best wishes as well. Um, now, uh, it's, not, it's lovely to be part of the afternoon Zoom session. There, when we were in Rome four years ago, we did a tour of the Colosseum and also the ghetto. And, uh, and uh, um, with the uh, Colosseum, there is an indication of Jewish slaves who were part of the workforce in the construction of the Colosseum they engrave their names into the cement. Mm. And you can see it um, when you're going up and down stairs. You look up, we were told, look up, and there you, you can see it in front of you. They've engraved their names, and there's some indication mm. that they were Jewish. There was a menorah or some indication of the, of the like. Really cool. Interesting, interesting. And Anna, go ahead. Um, were they Ashkenazi or Sephardi Jews, or you wouldn't so that's know? That's what's so interesting about Roman Jews is they have their own Roman right because they came from Judea to Rome, and they've they've passed down their own um, minhag Romaniot, um, Romaniot, I think, 
And so they have a different C door. And again, like around, I guess like the 1600s, there was an influx of Sephardi Jews coming from Spain with the expulsion from Spain. Um, so like my friend Dora, like her mom's family is like latecomers to um, Rome because they're from uh, the expulsion from Spain, but we don't think of that as particularly um, newcom newcomers. Um, but so, but the, the Nusach, the special, the synagogue service is very different in Rome. And even people who've traveled all over the world sort of say when they go to Rome, they don't know what's going on. Um, and and it's, it's very cool. And it's very interesting how different it is. Um, and they, they, if you, if you look on Facebook, the great synagogue in Rome does a Hoshana Rabbah service. And that is like the coolest thing to watch because they're, everyone's walking around the synagogue with their etro, lulav and etrog and sort of banging the, um, the and then they bang the aravot and it's, it's, it's really cool to see. So if you ever want to see that, I would look that up. So you do, when you go to a synagogue today, mm. would you choose an, could you choose an Ashkenazi or a Sephardi or an original one? No, you choose, the, they have their Roman Sidorim, um in the so back. The original Romans. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I don't know how original it is, but they do have it in the back. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, so I mean, my husband bought one of their cedarine because it's really cool. And it is different than Florence. Flor the Florentine Jewish community is, um, so follows the Sephardic right, even though it's a bit different, the cedar, it's different between Rome and Florence. Thank you. Linda, thank as you. always, thank you so much. That was fascinating, beautifully presented, lots of, of interesting material to look at, um, and, and we're always so glad to have you talk to us and, and teach us. We always all learn so much from you. So, uh, thank you. Oh, gosh. Thank you so much.